and they're curious. I've watched little kids go up, little five, six-year-old kids, and they want to poke the eyes. And I'm like, well, you see that bush right there? <laughs> There's your bathroom. Yeah. I mean, you can learn a lot by watching videos on YouTube. I, I can probably learn how to take my own appendix out. Just like the West, you know, hunters look at it as it's more of a romantic endeavor. You know, you got the sunsets and the big mountains. and Living Country in the City, Episode 10. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Living Country in the City. We're still here at the International Sportsman's Expo in Salt Lake City, talking with a lot of great people, uh, a lot of people really generous with their time. We've got a busy expo here, and uh, today... Uh, I was able to steal Guy Eastman away from his booth for a bit. Uh, Guy Eastman of the Eastman family and Eastman Hunting Journals. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me on. A lot of our audience uh, isn't super experienced with hunting, uh, either new to it or just doesn't have a background in it. Uh, why don't you give me a little introduction about yourself and your history with hunting? Okay. I uh, I was fortunate enough, I guess, like like a lot of people here at this show, to, to grow up in hunting. My grandfather started you know like you know taught my dad how to hunt my dad taught me how to hunt and I'm teaching my kids how to hunt so it's a you know family tradition more of a traditional uh, uh, sport and you know my grandfather started in the industry filming uh, he was a pioneer in the filming and hunting industry he started filming and uh, hunting videos and no, it wasn't videos that time film in 1957 and so he was one of the first guys to go into remote parts of Alaska and the Northwest Territories and, you know, up north uh, doing f filming. He would film these adventures and bring them down here and, and show them to a live audience. I could imagine the uh, the filming equipment was a little little heavier and a little more bulky back then as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't. Some people I think nowadays don't realize how good we have it, how easy we have it. I used to help him when I was a little kid in those big 16 millimeter film cameras, and you'd have to change the the magazine in in a bag, <laughs> you know, a dark bag, so it wouldn't expose the film, and and you know, so expensive. It was a dollar a foot to to develop it and a huge battery packs and I mean the cameras were just massive <laughs> everything was was quite a production now we, we can film on our phones yeah so a little little different than swapping the SD card on a on a GoPro attached to your uh, attached to your bow or yes. rifle or whatever it may be yeah and, exactly exactly well so uh, a lot of a lot of this program is geared towards uh, people in the city who find hunting inaccessible. They're interested, and I actually just got an email this morning um, about someone who is saying, you know, I've always wanted to go hunting. My kids are grown up, they're out of the house now, uh, but I'm in the middle of Los Angeles. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to even go about this. What would you say to someone, uh, someone that came to you with that question? Where do I... Where do I begin to start learning about this, start figuring stuff out? You know, it's, uh, for me, I was, and a lot of people that I know that live around this area grew up hunting, learn, you know, like I said earlier, learned it from their parents. But the good thing about this sport is you don't have to learn it that way. You know, it doesn't have to be passed on to you. You can, I know a lot, quite a few guys that are first generation hunters, you know, same thing. They didn't, didn't grow up in it parents didn't hunt they had no problem with it but then something spurred their curiosity and they just kind of took it from there but you know my my advice would be start small start simple and grow from there uh it's it, there's a lot of facets to this it can be overwhelming and intimidating but if you just bite off a small piece at first and get your feet wet and then then go from there i mean that might be just a bird hunt or go goose hunting or, you know, just try to find somebody who, who does it and then, you know, try to tag along and maybe even don't hunt at first. I have a friend who, who didn't grow up hunting at all. I went to college with, and he just, his first few trips, he just come along, just tag along and, and carry, help carry camp gear and, and help pack out elk for us. And then it just grew from there. And then he got more and more familiar with it. 
and then he wasn't you know he got more familiar with being in the back country backpacking and all that and then he started hunting he didn't jump in head first you know he started off small i don't know a lot of hunters if you came to them and said hey i want to help you pack out your elk or i <laughs> i want to i want to come with you don't want to shoot anything but i just want to watch you and then i will help you carry out and pack in pack out whatever you need i don't know a lot of hunters as long as you're respectful i don't know a lot of hunters that would really turn that that down no no <laughs> uh free help is always welcome in a hunting camp you know i mean there's a lot of facets to hunting it's not you know some people think it's just going up the hill and shooting something and it's not that simple and there's a lot of work that goes into everything that we do out there to bring back all that meat and and per, you know process it to eat so help is always welcome and i i agree with you 100 percent. even if you just met someone on the internet there's some great forums i mean we have a forum on our website uh at the eastman website that you know there's a lot of hardcore hunters in there but once in a while i'll see someone post something just like you said that they're kind of a newbie to it and they're just looking for some information or someone to guide them you know help not guide them guide them but guide them along yeah. the way and and pretty soon after plugging into that resource they're they're gathering information knowledge through the whole year and then you know someone invites them on a hunt and they go on a hunt with someone they met online you know and it's then they light that fire and it just grows from there and I definitely, I've definitely seen that a lot in, in the various forums. I'll make sure to link to the, the Eastman's forum on, uh, on our show notes page. I'll announce that at the end of the show. Um, but I've even noticed it at places here. You know, you come, y you sit and wander, and a lot of people, they'll come for one day. I, I made a point. I came for the whole weekend. Um, I was able to take the time and, and, and sit and talk with folks, and I've met a lot of as I said, really fantastic, really generous people who are always willing to, you know, uh, here's my email address. You know, I may not be able to get back to you immediately, but, you know, send me questions if you, you know, need any tips. Uh, you know, if I hear of anyone looking for a hunting partner, you know, I'll kind of, I'll connect you guys. Uh, things like that I've noticed is just, um, this is a very generous, very kind of community where everyone wants to see everyone succeed right and, and i think you know i sit at at uh, these shows and i kind of just watch people kind of like sitting at the airport kind of people watching zoning out once in a while and you know i i think looking at the type of people that hunters are i think there's a lot of intimidation factor there or there would be for someone who's not in the community because you know a lot of them have beards and tattoos and backpacks and and camo and you know and i think for an outsider that might be a little bit intimidating you know and but like you said i think that hunters are, are really generous people welcoming they want more people in the community because you know that that's kind of what hunting is about it has been since probably the cavemen days it's a you know people have especially men have a you know a a uh, a desire to go provide you know hunter gatherer instinct and sitting around that campfire with other guys telling those hunting and outdoor stories is is really a, a big part of it for people and sharing those experiences so it's it's a community that likes to in, be more inclusionary i think than people might realize you know from the outside Absolutely. well speaking of hunting stories are there any uh any exciting stories recently that you might be able to share with our with our community uh, uh, a memorable hunt uh, doesn't necessarily have to be recent but uh just something that that you really that really speaks to the passion you have for hunting just this year <laughs> this would be kind of like the you know the traditional pass it on type thing my i have a nephew who's 12 years old his name's jack and he's this is the first year he could hunt and his father dad doesn't hunt he's my sister's kid and uh and so my dad's kind of taken him under his wing. Grandpa has and taught him, taught him everything you know he needs to know about hunting. But he finally pa he passed his hunter safety course. He'd been shooting all all summer, and he this was his first year to hunt in Wyoming. And so, uh, so we took him out in Wyoming on antelope hunt. You know, Wyoming for anybody who's listening to this, Wyoming has a lot of opportunity. It's a great state to come to and apply. There's a lot of public land in Wyoming, over well over half the state's public, lots of animals. Uh, antelope hunt is a great hunt to start people on. That's usually what we kind of start 
kids and wives or anybody who's just getting into hunting it's a great first big game hunt because you see a lot of animal animals because there's a lot of them it's not real physical um they're not huge animals like it's not like an elk that takes five or six loads to pack out you know but it's a great first time hunt so we took jack on antelope hunt and well, they're a beautiful animal too it's yeah like they're, they're just such really a cool neat. animal yeah, there's a lot of interesting things about them that, you know, they, they, them and the American bison are the two only two truly native animals to North America, the biologists think. They okay. didn't come across the Bering Strait like most everything else we have. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so they're, they're really an interesting animal. You know, they can run six, almost 60 miles an hour. Uh, <gasps> You know, there's there's a they're really interesting interesting animal. But anyway, we take Jack on his first hunt. You know, and it's interesting. You know, when I was a kid, I, my dad taught me how to hunt. He's really he had almost zero patience. You know, all, <laughs> all he did was turn around and say, "Watch where you step. Can you be any louder? My gosh, it sounds sounds like you have bricks on your feet." You know. <laughs> be quiet be quiet you know and then when i get to this hunt with jack i'm filming and he's he's kind of helping jack and i'm like who's this guy he's the most patient man in the world <laughs> you know I, so grandpa and dad are not the same people you know 20 30 years later but it was it was fun jack got a really nice antelope but you know dad spent a lot of time with him and you know he knew his boundaries and how far he could shoot and waited for a really nice shot and he got a nice one shot kill which is really important, you know, for... And how old is he again? 12. Right. 12. And, and that's, you know, when, when you uh, get that first kill and you watch someone go through that, it's always a really, really emotional experience, even for the people who are around that person, you know, because it's, it's kind of like a rite of passage almost, you know, and you lay that first animal down and everybody has, you know, of course, the respect for the animal. It's going to provide, you know, meat for, for the family. And, uh, and it's a real emotional experience. And so it's very important for first time hunters to have that be a good experience, you know, a wounded animal and things are going sideways and, and people are yelling at each other. That's not a good first experience and it can intimidate people away from, from it. You know, because you're taking the life of an animal to provide food for your, for yourself and your family, and that's that's a that's a big thing. It's yeah. a big responsibility. So, how uh, how early and how how would you go about uh, introducing you know a, a younger family member, a nephew, a, a child, um, a cousin? How uh, about what age and and in what ways would you start introducing them to to hunting uh, or big game hunting even? I've, you know, I've been around it quite a bit, although I only have one kid and she's, re she's only two. So she's definitely too young to, to realize this, <laughs> but, but a lot of guys at the office have quite a few kids and I see how they, you know, how they bring them up in it. And, and the best advice I can give is start early. And, and I don't mean, you know, take them out there and drag them around when it's five below zero in the snow and make it uncomfortable, but just start those kids understanding that, you know, what you're doing and what it's about. This is, this is about hunting. I, I hate calling it a sport cause it's not really a sport, but it's a, it's a tradition, you know, and get them in that so that it seems like kids, especially girls, little girls will turn that point about 10, 10 to 12 when they're grossed out by it mm -hmm. you know what i mean but if you get them before that the five and six years old around the meat and the dead animal and they start to understand life and death at that point and then by the time they're 12 and 14 they're not grossed out about it that's just yeah and you know it's kind of like ranch kids you know when you grow you up go. on a farm or a ranch they know where the beef on the plate comes from okay they know it doesn't come from walmart you know, oh, yeah. walmart sells it but they understand the life and death of that of the world basically and so you start them a little you know as young as possible with that so and they're curious i've watched little kids go up little five six year old kids and they want to poke the eyes and you know <laughs> this is the heart and this is the liver little biology dissection seminar and, and they say that dissected frog ain't got nothing on uh yeah <laughs> on a, a deer or an elk no <laughs> man no it, and a heart the whole size of that animal you're di originally exactly dissected in high school. exactly it's interesting i went on a hunt um last summer a buffalo hunt uh for american bison in yep. uh, montana on the indian reservation 
and I was hunting with some of my friends who were Indians, Native Americans, and when we shot the buffalo, they had their kids there and stuff, and I mean, th- these kids have been around dead stuff and buffalo since they were mm-hmm. just born, and man, I'll tell you, you got that buffalo on the ground, and we were all doing the work on it, you do, we do, and those kids were tearing that stuff apart and just dissecting it oh I. man <laughs> it was, they were they couldn't wait they couldn't wait to get their hands on it but they grew up in it you mm-hmm. know they the curiosity it's curiosity at that point not grossed out and freaked out which yeah. is, is what you'll get when you get a 14 year old and you lay a, a cow elk down on the ground that's going to be a pretty traumatic experience for that person to see or a kid to see it at the first time at 14 yeah but if they're used to that at four or five and six it's uh, not a big a deal. Well, you know, and it, they they gain that respect for where their meals come from, where their food comes from. And, uh, you know, I, I had this discussion uh, a couple days ago. I think there would be a lot less problems with with obesity and overeating if people, one, had knew where their meat was coming from, were eating leaner, healthier meat, and two had to work for it and and go get it themselves and you know you wouldn't be going through nearly as much of this i think if you knew where this came from and and really gained a respect for it um you know people people now it's just like you said that you know the magic walmart fairy drops off uh steaks and ground beef uh into your freezer and that's where it comes from they don't you know they didn't have to work for it they don't know you know what ha- how how it happened to the cow and you know even even that little diaper in the um in the bottom of the the meat pan uh, or in the in the meat container is designed to remove any traces of you know oh this was a living breathing creature that that may have bled at one time or another um but it's just i i feel like there would be a lot less problems with the meat industry and people overeating if even if even if just once in their life people had to actually go take an animal and and prepare it and process it and 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 do that you know soup to nuts and see where everything came from yeah i agree with you it, and there you know there's it's, we see it all the time in the hunting community cuz we're that's what we do that's who we are but when you bring in someone outside that's an you can almost watch it on their face like my buddy i was talking about that I mean, he's a city guy. You know, when he first went on that first hunt and we killed a bull elk and we're cutting it up and we're hauling it out and then we processed it and home cut it up, packaged it, and I sent some home with him. You know, he lives in Phoenix to Arizona and he fed it to his kids and he, he, there was a lot of pride there. You know, yep. he's a, it's a little traumatic at first, but then they get into it and then when you bring home something that you got yourself and fed it to your family there's a lot of pride there and now he understands i don't think he looks at the meat aisle the same way in walmart yep you know anymore for for that reason but you could just see on his face connecting the dots on every step we took from seeing the bull on the mountain stalking up to the bull shooting the bull breaking the bull down you know package until he had frozen packages that would make hamburgers and Mm -hmm. feed his family and neighbors then all the dots connect and you go, oh, I see the full cycle of this. You know, and, and like you said, as men, you know, and it's and it's not politically correct to say it all, but, you know, very little I do in this world is politically correct. So. <laughs> but, you know, as men, we we want to have that pr- that pride that we can provide for our family and and in more than just a, a monetary way, but in a way that we know we are are capable we are are strong enough to to take care of our family in a in a very primal sense and it's it's not politically correct to say but it's i think inherent whether you want to admit it or not inherent in in most men i think so and some women have it you know oh yeah i I think there's probably a percentage there but i think higher percent of men have it than women but yeah you're right it's it's that you know they're is a, a lot of, of pride and confidence, you know, for a guy to know that, well, if worse comes to worse, I can go up that hill and shoot a cow elk and package it up, mm-hmm. and feed my family for the winter, you know, and, and America has lost a lot of that, you know, just as we've yep. become a more developed society and, and, 
you know, the urban areas have grown and people don't see that part of flyover America from the two coasts, so to speak. And people have unplugged from that a little bit, but, but, you know, it's never too late just because you grew up in the city or it's never too late. I've seen it hundreds of times people at these shows that come up and you know just like your background and they get into hunting and pretty soon they're full completely submerged in it well you know know, that's that's my whole motto for the podcast for for the blog and everything is trying to bring flyover state spirit to the concrete jungle it's really just trying to to take all of that culture all of that that heritage and history and and introduce that to people that that haven't been exposed to it then they may they may have a negative view of it they just may not have any view of it um because they've never they've just short of maybe uh, the occasional movie watching a little bit too much uh dances with wolves or deer hunter or something that's their only experience with hunting um and so i i really want people to see the whole this whole picture that's not not this strange hollywood uh interpretation of it not the you know not the TV interpretation with with drunk Bubba sitting on the back of their pickup truck and however much I love to sit in the tailgate of a pickup truck and have a beer that's not what hunting's about you know maybe right. maybe afterwards after you take the animal and it's processed and done and you're good then you then you sit back and enjoy the beer but right uh, and it's a, it's really a regional deal hunting oh, yeah. is you know the down south has their own hunting culture. Texas has its own hunting culture. The Rocky Mountain West has its hunting culture, you know, in the north, in the Midwest has its hunting culture. I went to school, college out there in Indiana, you know, so it's all a little bit different hunting culture. Um, It's all about hunting, about the same thing. But, you know, it's interesting that it's it's somewhat regional. Well, yeah, and there's, I mean, there's different ways, different methods, and it, because there's also different animals with different habits, different terrain. Right. And a lot of it, comes from that and you know you see a a lot more on the east like you said you'll see uh, a lot of whitetail you'll see more uh, more tree stand hunting and and people do their research up front and they're able to find okay this is where I need to put my tree stands and and this is how I need to prep for the season and and do this and it's it's a very different experience that's a lot of how I was introduced to hunting Um, I I was uh, out in the south this past uh, this past Thanksgiving um, got to sit in my first tree stand in uh, it, rainy, f- near freezing weather, and and have all the warmth sucked out of my body in that metal tree stand. <laughs> um, that was a, but it was it was interesting and exciting, and it was I loved it because it was calming and it it you know was very like recentering, and I I would sit and focus and just relax and enjoy nature, and you know you could hear every. I I never in my life thought I would hear every uh, a leaf bounce off every limb of a tree until I sat in a in a tree stand and it sounds and I swear it sounds like a deer walking through the forest when a single leaf falls. Oh yeah, but, <laughs> you, you actually because in those tree stands it's it it's so quiet you just kind of the woods just swallow you up and you become part of it Mm -hmm. yeah and i don't have the patience to do that very you know i didn't grow up doing it but you know some guys i mean they'll sit in those things for 30 days Mm -hmm. you know straight hunting for a big buck it's i don't know how they do it but it's you know it's i think it's it's all everything's a developed skill and believe it or not sitting still and quietly and and still being able to because it's easy to just let your brain shut off and and not even think about it. So when something does come, you're you're not ready for it. But to still be able to be focused that entire time. So when something does come out, and you have that that moment where it pauses, and, you know, you make you make that uh, grunt or that dope dope call, and it and it pauses long enough for you to take your shot. It, it it's an actual learned skill to be able to sit still and quietly that entire time, but still keep that mental focus. Um, but then you have, you know, on the, the opposite end of things, uh, you know, Rocky Mountain and uh, kind of the Western style, more Western style of spot and stock hunting, which is, I, I mean, just about as, as opposite as you can get, except, you know, except when you're sitting in glassing, maybe. Right. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're hunting, you're actively looking for the animal. You're, um, you know, often, often traipsing up and down washes and, uh, and saddles and all of this uh, climbing in and out, and so it's very, 
it's it's definitely you're you're having to stop and keep your focus there too but it's typically because you're you're sucking wind and right <laughs> it's when, it's a more physical mm -hmm. uh you know physical endeavor than than say some of the other hunting is and i think the western hunting just like the west you know hunters look at it as it's more of a romantic endeavor you know you got the sunsets and the big mountains and you know it's a lot of guys even from you know everywhere in the country desire to come out here and hunt elk you know it's a lifelong dream for them to to get one nice bull you know just to you know a lot of guys down south that's kind of their their dream hunt is yeah. to come out here and, and do that and we kind of take that i think for granted those of us who live out here because we're so used to it but but you know it doesn't people don't need to be intimidated by it i mean nope. there there is you know ins and outs to that but there's good resources out there you know we have a magazine that that walks people through how to apply for tags and and how all those processes work and tips and tactics and strategies and i mean you can learn a lot by watching videos on youtube i, I can probably learn how to take my own appendix out you know on <laughs> youtube if i wanted to i mean so you know even if a guy is in la or new york or houston you, you can you know chicago you can start doing a lot of research you know on on your own before you even have to set foot and and jump in head first on it yep. on that note let's take a quick moment to hear from one of our partners hey y'all if you're like me a new elk hunter really trying to up your game and get into backcountry big game hunting or if you're an experienced hunter trying to fill tags more consistently you really need to check out elk101.com's university of elk hunting online course if you're looking for a central resource to really take you all the way from start to finish when it comes to big game hunting, this is it. Corey Jacobson is a world champion elk caller and one of the definitive experts when it comes to elk hunting. And in this online course, he shares over 30 years of his elk hunting experience, strategies, and tips. All of this is broken down into easy to digest modules and packed full of great video content as well. This will provide you with all of the resources you need to be a confident elk hunter, regardless of your past experience. What's even better is you can get $10 off the University of Elk Hunting online course by visiting my partners page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash partners. So we were talking about some of the resources uh, Eastman's offers. You were talking about uh, the magazine that uh, kind of walks you through step by step uh, how to apply for tags, things like that. Um, what other resources do you offer or would you recommend for uh, someone getting into hunting? You know, I, you know, a ma the magazine's a great a great way to uh, to do that. You know, it gets it's kind of piecemeal fed to you. You know, get one every month delivered to your your mailbox and learn something new every month. But also, there's there's some really good book resources out there. I mean, my dad's written you know three books, best four best selling books on on Western hunting, each species specific so one on elk two on mule deer and one on antelope and those those really dive in heavy on behavior and you know when did the elk rut what are the five phases of the elk rut you know what so you know if you're applying for a tag and that's a hunt dates of september 15th what are the elk going to be doing then you know are they in the rut out of the rut peak of the rut you know what what's going on there so you know reading those books is can be a huge advantage for you know talking about the equipment what are you going to need how are you going to what do you do with it once it's down how do you break it down how you know how do you pack it out how do you load your pack what kind of equipment are you going to need you know knives you know just everything that really goes along with that so there's good resources there like we talked about earlier on the internet you know some of these forums there's guys on i'm always surprised when i even when i look at our forums some guys give all kinds of valuable information or over almost overly helpful to other guys on there with information that you know on areas and when where to go you know sometimes i'm like you know because hunters are pretty secretive guys they're like fishermen you know where'd yeah. you catch that big fish oh well, i'm not gonna tell you <laughs> kind of thing with their they, areas they might tell you the state that, yeah <laughs> exactly but sometimes I, i'm surprised on there you know guys will say oh, i'll go up this creek drainage park here and and camp here and head up that creek you're gonna find pretty good hunting and sure enough they yep. come back on there two months later with a photo of a buck or a bull they killed up there so you know, there's a lot of resources especially if a guy is is new to it you know hunters like we talked about earlier i think they they want to be they want to grow the community 
you know, that's a, a primal thing of it. That goes along with the tradition of passing it down to your kids, your grandkids, but also passing it down to someone else, you know, and so they, they n- naturally tend to want to, to bring people into the fold. So if, you know, a guy gets on there, he's honest, hey, I'm just getting into this. Can you help me out? I think guys would be more, they would follow over themselves to get somebody started, you know, for the first time. Well, you know, every new hunter is, you know, you, you think about it. Every new hunter is the potential then to expand to, you know, however many new hunters. You know, it's just, it's exponential growth. And all of those new hunters are, are one more person that's going to uh, work towards building what we have. You know, it's it's one less person that's going to... Uh, vote against uh, some hunting initiative or whatever it may be. Um, So, you know, the more people we get involved and then the more people they get involved and the more people, those following people get involved, it's just, it's exponential growth. And any encouragement you can give to those people is is one step further to keeping the tradition of hunting alive um, more than just, more than just passing it along to your kids. Yeah. And you know, the one story I've never heard sitting at all these shows, talking to all these people, I've never heard someone who started hunting and didn't like it and quit. Yep. I never hear that story ever. Now I hear, you know, stories like some guys, their wives will do it for a little while and then they get busy with the kids or whatever and don't really do it anymore. But I've never heard somebody of a story of someone who totally turned their back on, on hunting after trying it. In fact, it's the opposite. There have been, you know, stories of people who are really against hunting, mm-hmm. but decided to take the step of, okay, I can't hate this th- without trying it. And once they tried it, they turned a corner and become became vocal voices for pro hunting. I was going to say, I feel like those people, they, the ones that were the most vehemently against it, once they once they hop over to the to the from the dark side. They they become the most most vocal and vehement advocates, right? Because I think they have that inherently in their personality, mm-hmm. and it just turns the table, and they turn a corner and go the other way with it. But you know, hunt, hunting is very very important. That the North American wildlife model. I mean, you can get into all that, how that whole thing works, and wildlife management, and where all the money comes from. It comes from hunters. They tax the guns and the ammo you know, the Pittman-Robertson tax and all that money goes back into managing the wildlife that everybody else enjoys. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not a hunter, when you go to Yellowstone Park or to Wyoming and you look at all that wildlife, that money to manage that came from hunters and fishermen. And everybody else gets to enjoy it for free. And a lot of people don't really understand how that whole thing works. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's a very important economic driver as well. I mean, over what, a bi- over a billion dollars a year? Billions. From hunters? Billions. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it, the number is absolutely mind boggling. You know, that, that uh, you know, the wildlife refuge system. How many people go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to that elk refuge and look at all those elk wintering out there? Millions and millions of people have seen that, you know, and that's all paid for by wildlife dollars that came from hunters. You know, that's that's how all that funding. They just didn't. They just don't operate that refuge on out of their good, you know, the the normal budgets. Yeah, it's you know, not. It's, it's not all everyone volunteering their time and 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 donating all of all of this money. It's it comes from from the the taxes that hunters lobbied to have put on their on their gear yeah exactly and and we and what other name me one other community in the country who willingly put a tax on themselves Mm -hmm. and was happy to do it hunters for the good of the wildlife that everybody gets to enjoy in the country whether you hunt or not yep you know and so it's it's a very when you start digging into that part of it you realize how important hunting is you know it's not just important for us as an individual to build that confidence to Mm -hmm. provide and put food on the table it's important to to the country really i mean you go back how they brought a lot of these animals to the brink of extinction back in you know before the turn of the century and and hunter voluntarily with their dollars and and hard work have brought all that back i mean and we're talking 
we're not just talking things like elk and pronghorn. I mean, I what wild turkey as well was yep. almost. Uh, yep. I think wasn't even, wasn't even weren't even ducks. Yeah, a lot of the ducks. Extinction. Yep, a lot of the ducks and uh, the buffalo mm -hmm. went from thirty million buffalo in the United States down to like three or four thousand. Jeez. And now it's back up to you know a couple two three million. I mean, it, it just you, the the numbers are just staggering. You know, and, and it's really a success story, yep. a huge success story, which you know it's all was all. Uh, done by by hunters dollars and the passion for for wildlife you know and then pe i think people don't really understand that maybe you're some of the people in your audience the the urban people living in the cities don't realize that the respect that hunters have for the wildlife i think they think oh we just want it up on the mountain so we can go shoot it and eat it and that's not how hunters think no nope. you know they're conservationists hunting is conservation and it sounds backwards to people. So you want to conserve something by killing it. Yep. But when you really dig into it, that's exactly, you know, what what uh, what hunters you know have, have done to bring all these this wildlife back from the verge of extinction. Because if if you don't have the hunting creates the value for the wildlife. And they're learning this in places in Africa, you know, third world countries, mm -hmm. that without the hunting, there's no value to the wildlife and it ceases to exist. I mean, it, it sounds backwards, but that's the way it really is. Pushed out by development. It gets, uh, you know, it just, it's it's not taken care of. Um, the people that, the the tourists that want to go, you know, go on the African safari or or the people coming in from out of state to go to Jackson Hole and look at those those elk herds, they're not the ones, yeah, they may be paying a nice little entrance fee or whatever whatever that may be, but they're not the ones who are who are supporting this conservation. That's I mean, it every bit helps, but that's not the percentages just aren't there and it wouldn't be there if if we had to solely rely on 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 tourism or or you know hikers <laughs> right yes exactly exactly so that's you know that's a whole nother facet to the the hunting puzzle that people you know might be interested in, in looking up and learning about you know because mm -hmm. it's really eye-opening and enlight enlightening for someone who doesn't know like i keep coming back to my friend in phoenix had no clue no clue about any of that and you just those are the things you talk about in hunting camps and when you're out there and he just gets enlightened every time a little more every time he comes out and pretty soon he's like i mean he's a smart guy he's an engineer so he's putting these pieces to the puzzle together and he gets it and now he's teaching his daughters because he's like i don't want my daughters to grow up in with a, just a city lifestyle, I want him to understand this. And so he started bringing his daughters out to Wyoming as well and, and learning that. And, you know, you should see their face when they were gutting out an elk and you just hand them a, you know, a back strap right out of an elk that's bloody. Here, hold this. <laughs> you know, the f first time you, you did, I did it, their eyes are as big as saucers and they're like holding it way away from themselves. And he, his wife was there and she was getting a little panicked. I said, no, just just wait it'll be all right they'll get used to it and sure enough by the end of the day those girls had their clothes bloody and they were in there <laughs> wrestling around with elk quarters and helping skin out take the skin off and it just took one day mm -hmm. one day and they're i mean they go back to the city and to their schools and stuff but now they understand how all that works well you know i mean kids are a lot more resilient than we always give them credit for and it's like i feel like I look at my nephews, you know, and now, gosh, my oldest nephew just turned 18, and that's freaking me out. But um, I, I look at them, and they grew up, uh, they grew up a, uh, kind of in the country a little bit more. They're up in Northern California, and it's it's a it's it's a lot more rural of an area. And uh, you know, there's there's actually some fantastic deer hunting up there. Um, but you know, they're tough. They're tough. But then I, I look at a lot of these kids who who didn't grow up in an environment like that and and they just you know you talk about camping or anything like that and they're like well where are the showers and bathrooms i'm like well you see that bush right there <laughs> there's your bathroom yeah <laughs> see this bottle of water that's about as much shower as you're gonna get this weekend yeah you go jump in the creek but yeah. it's 38 degrees <laughs> 
<laughs> or uh, just just chip that ice off and, and, and yeah. stick your stick your head in the in the river there. But um, but you know after you get them out there, uh, you know a lot of these these younger kids they can develop that so quickly versus you know maybe some some adults who uh, who don't quite uh, take to it as easily. You know kids kids can adjust and and learn things and bounce back from things so much quicker than than any of us can um it's it's amazing and so when you when you take them out there even uh you know even if they've never been exposed to that like you said it give them a day and it's suddenly it's a new adventure it's not this weird scary strange thing it's it's this exciting new adventure that then they get to take back to and share with their friends at school or or wherever that may be yeah their their mind mind and emotions haven't been cluttered with societal norms yet so they you know they're so young that it's almost a clean slate and they just soak it up like a sponge Mm -hmm. you know they don't yeah kids you know that's why it's important if you can you know i think to to get the kids immersed in this you know between the age of five and ten you know to start getting them in this if, if possible whether it's just fishing you know, and it's to start with and then hunting later on, but get them out there in, in the outside. Cause they love, I mean, kids dig it. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people complain about their kids sitting on the Xbox or the PlayStation in the, in the basement too much, but you know, you take them out of that element and get them outside. And I mean, they adapt quick. They're, they'll, they'll take to it fast, real fast. You just have to, it just takes an effort for, for the parents or whoever to, to go do it. Cause sometimes it's more, uh, kind of can be a hassle, mm-hmm. you know, but once you do it, kids, uh, they love being outside and exploring and finding frogs and fishing and wading around in the river, the Creek and chopping wood and sitting around the campfire. I mean, we, at our booth here at the show, we have that fake fire. It's of course we're inside. So we have that fake fire. Yeah. Those kids turn the corner and they go right to that thing. Yep. I mean, it's almost like it's just pre-programmed into their brain as little mini humans to go to the fire, you know? And I they, think every time I've come over to that booth, there's a little kid sitting over there, like, warm, you know, quote unquote, warming his hands over the fire. It's it's the funniest thing. I, I yeah. guarantee every time I've walked over there, there's been at least one little kid by that fire. Yeah, exactly. It's really, really crazy. And I think the same way with the, the outdoors, you know, the kids, once they get out, just take them out there and and like you said they'll be uncomfortable at first like oh this is cold this sucks i don't want to be here but and then pretty soon they get more more used to it hour by hour and then by after two couple days it's old hat to them this is no problem (laughs) i want to go again next time you know they're looking forward to the next time so it's it's really important i think for people to, to get their their kids out there to the outside the more they understand about our natural world the more they'll understand about life itself because yep. it's life and death. And I think that's part of the problem that we have with the Walmart scenario of don't know where their meat comes from. Cause they don't understand the life and death of that meat. It's just a piece of hamburger. Yep. You know, so, so, um, if you had to pick a, a favorite hunter, a favorite animal you've hunted, and then maybe if, uh, a hunt, that either you're you've still left to do or you're really looking forward to. Uh, my favorite hunt is big mule deer trophy. You know, big mule deer, uh, high mountain mule deer. Um, you know, there's deer everywhere out west, but you know, mule deer is the species that we have the most of out west. Not the white tail like they have. We have some white tail, but not a, not as much as the Midwest. But you know, those high mountain bucks, ten thousand feet of, and above, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho. Montana, even some parts of Utah, that's, uh, there's no better hunt in my, my opinion than that. Just being up there, high elevation, they're up there with the mountain sheep, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, those big bucks in the high country is, is about as good as it gets. I, I think in my opinion, there's no, no challenge greater probably in, in hunting in, uh, the lower 48 here than, than that, I think. And Any, anything hunt. in the world, like what, whatever you you're looking forward to. Uh, sheep. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to actually been saving my my money for ten years to to put this together to go to uh, Tajikistan this December to okay. uh, Asia and hunt uh, Marco Polo sheep and 
in uh, oh, wow. Asia. So that's going to be quite an experience. It's a, it's an endeavor. I mean, airplanes, 24 hour car ride or Jeep ride on two track road, oh. then horseback, you know, it's, it's uh, a two week endeavor. It's going to be, going to be a, a big adventure. Are you putting together like a, a film or a, a yep. some spots for this? That'd yep. Be... Yep. We're going to film it and, uh, and it'll probably end up on YouTube. So it's going to be quite, quite an adventure. Fantastic. Well, okay. Any uh, any closing words for uh, for some new hunters? Maybe a word of encouragement, or uh, for all of us uh, city folk trying to trying to get out and do a little bit of hunting. You know, I and like we talked about earlier at the beginning of the show. I say, you know, if you're just you have curiosity about the the hunting world and want to get into it, start slow, but don't be intimidated. You know, this is a community of people who want to grow the community. Um, just because everybody's dressed in camo and has beards and and carries guns doesn't mean that they're not uh, not wanting to invite you along and and you know don't be intimidated by it. Just get out there and and start slow and start learning and gathering the information and and pick a state, pick a species, and start building that hunt. I mean, half of the fun and excitement about this is p- the planning. Mm-hmm. You know, the planning and putting it together, building a plan, putting it together, executing the plan relish the adventure as it happens and come back with the meat and the the prize of the the adventure and and look forward to the next one because that's the beauty of all this there's always next season right it never ends never ends well you heard it from the man himself guy eastman thank you so much for joining me on the show i appreciate taking the time out of your busy schedule this weekend well thank you for having me on it's been a been a real fun fun chatting with you All right, y'all, that's going to do it for episode 10 of Living Country in the City. Another big thank you to Guy Eastman for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. Make sure you check out both him and Eastman's hunting journals on social media as well as their website. If you can, pick up a subscription to the magazine. You can find links for all of those on our show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash 10. That's livingcountryinthecity.com slash 10. Also, if you like the episode, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast platform. And in the meantime, stay country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com.